After all these years, our mission remains as ever to bring you the nation's most celebrated poets and writers, along with the Northeast's finest musicians in programs that lift your spirits and grow your minds. And if we have a little fun along the way, I promise you'll get over it. <laughs> when lo, these many years ago, we started the Arts Cafe, poets and musicians were so much cheaper and easier to engage. <clears throat> and we were all, well, a little younger. Really, really though, aren't anniversaries the cruelest of moments? Aren't they the surest measure of what Shakespeare calls the inaudible and noiseless foot of time? My beloved Catherine, where are you, my dear? My beloved Catherine tells me that we've been married 30 years. I ask you, I ask you, how do such things happen? In any case, Hell, in every case. We intend to celebrate the mile, this milestone year throughout the year in the several shows to come. I know of no better way than to start a celebration than with a glass of bubbly libation in hand. So while we gear you up for toasting, you may pour, incidentally, if you have not yet. <laughs> May I have a glass? Could somebody give me a glass, please? Thank you. Oh, I'll take all that I can <laughs> So, let us begin at the beginning. Will Melanie Greenhouse please stand up? Stay there. As many of you know, Melanie and I, with the help of some friends, conceived and founded the Arts Cafe. Then she ably, I might say brilliantly, directed its course for those first 10 long years. It was an amusing idea, wasn't it, my dear? And you made it work. So won't you lift your glass and join me in saying, to Melanie. Melanie. <clears throat> mm. Next, let me ask the members of the Arts Cafe's board to stand. Come on. You need. You need, you need to know these good people. Stay standing, please. John Sutherland, Bill Grady, Wendy Halsey, Thea Moore, where's Thea? And a girl, Thea. Ben Philbrook and Liz Raisbeck. My friends, my friends, these are the folks who put in the sweat equity behind the scenes to make sure we balance our budget and have the resources to keep this series going. So won't you please lift your glass and join me in saying, join me in saying, praise the board. Praise the board. Thank you. <laughs> Lastly, lastly for tonight, let me ask all of you to stand. I mean this. All of you, stand up. <clears throat> Don't worry, I won't call all of your names. <laughs> now take a look around you. Ask yourself, ask yourself, who the hell are these people? <laughs> and what are they doing here? Like you, they have paid to be here. Like you, they're curious about what will happen to them tonight. Like you, they are the reason 
You are the reason that the Arts Cafe Mystic exists. You know, we've presented the greatest poets in the land at this very podium, and all of them comment to us about our audience. About you. <laughs> they are all moved by the focus of your attention, your concentrated curiosity, your sense of humor, your warm humanity. So lift your glass and join me in saying, glory be to the audience. Glory be to the audience. All right, <laughs> sit down. And, and because he will not say so himself, could we please toast Christy? Thank you. Thank you. Get out of here. <clears throat> Our opening voice tonight is the accomplished poet and teacher Edwina Trentham. Though she lives among us now in Moodus, Ms. Trentham has an unusual and, on its surface, enviable background having grown up in Bermuda and Washington, D.C. Her father was a British diplomat, her mother a socialite beauty. The contradiction between the idyllic, almost mythical trappings of her childhood and the truth of her parents' disastrous marriage <laughs> <clears throat> formed the thematic core of her wonderful debut book of poems, Stumbling into the Light. Ms. Trentham's poems have been widely published in some of the best literary journals and are frequently anthologized. She is read as a featured poet at many important venues, including the Sunken Garden Poetry Series and at this podium as well. She's also been a resident at Yadu, and a recipient of the Yates Society Poetry Prize. She is a professor emeritus at Ajnatank and has taught and taught for several years also at Wesleyan. And she founded and served as the editor of Freshwater, a highly regarded poetry journal. She comes to us tonight with a cool new book called Dinner Parties which contains a series of very grown-up sonnets that measure the pulse of fraught dynamics among couples and friends. Her elegant, well-balanced poetic line and vivid storytelling make for poems that are insightful and emotionally gripping. I should add that Dinner Parties has been published as a limited edition with remarkable illustrations by the artist Nancy Goodrich and graphic design by Mary Lou Conley. It is, as you will see, a special book. But won't you see for yourself as you join me in welcoming Edwina Trentham. <clears throat> Well, actually, dinner parties is about my own disastrous first marriage. I thought he just gave me such a lead-in for that, really. <laughs> Thank you, Christy. That was beautiful. And I'm so happy to be here tonight in this wonderful, wonderful place. And what I'm going to do tonight is read a group of sonnets, beginning with about three, th with three of them from dinner parties. And then I'm going to read a sonnet a couple of sonnets that I wrote in a workshop that I taught this summer called If You Get There Before I Do, Love, Death, and Poetry. And some of you will recognize that title. It's Dick Allen's, a wonderful poem. And so I'd like to dedicate my reading tonight to Dick Allen, who was such a powerful force for poetry and supporter of poets. So I'm going to begin reading from Dinner Parties, which is, as Christy said, a series of sonnets. They're beautifully illustrated by Nancy Goodrich. And they take place in and around Essex. And the names have been changed, mostly. Um, thanks, thanks, actually, to Sarah, who said, you can't use that name, Edwina. 
and anyway, I moved to Essex when I was 22, right after I married. Um, my husband was 31, 32 actually, 33 actually, yeah. And he had three children from a first marriage, and it was a very interesting experience to move to Essex from Bermuda. So I'm going to read the first three poems from this. Little Pet. He tells her to wear the turquoise flowered dress, the one he bought her with a tight elastic above her breasts. Reminds her John is his best friend and he expects an island girl to look the part. John and Shirley have easily 10 years on him, 20 on her. But she soon finds comfort in the rattles of ice, and they pet her like a dear little cat. So she decides to ignore the hollows and the cold glitter of old quarrels, presses hands to her hot cheeks, and collapses lost in giggles when she trips upstairs to pee, waits until night is early dawn to ask Shirley when love gets easier, chooses not to hear, it never gets better. <laughs> this next one is called Raw. Invited to stop by for a bite with Raymond, bull-necked lawyer in love with sailing, and his wife Millie, who never goes outside except to drive their two furious teenagers to school, they pound the dolphin knocker seven times before the door flings open, thuds the wall, and they ease past Millie into woolly darkness, where dinner is scatters of rice, raw beef swaddled in bacon, a half-baked Alaska that melts in clotted pools on their plates. They all nod each time Raymond raises the bottle, lifting his eyebrows. And by the time they settle on the porch for what her mother-in-law always calls cat pee coffee, she, she has taught herself to shift her gaze just in time when Millie tries to catch it. This next one, uh, um, yes, this takes place in Essex too, yes. Julia's Feet. Right after they get back from the Vietnam War protest in DC, they are asked to a dinner party at Mac and Julia's. He has told her two things. Mac is a Korean War vet, and Julia has perfect feet. Wears sandals all year round, inside and out, except in snow, to show them off. She stops to admire Julia's ruby nails, her straight white toes in blue velvet strappy heels, before she slips upstairs to repair the French twist he now insists she wear. She is perched before Julia's mirror, loose hair falling in tangles around her bare shoulders, when Mac's reflection snarls, hey, out of my house, you traitors. She trails past silent guests, keeps her eyes on Julia's feet, her beautiful toes. Okay, so that's dinner parties. A lot of fun, <laughs> a lot of fun. <laughs> yep, okay. So, <laughs> I'm gonna read a couple of other sonnets now. Um, a little short of a year after I married and moved from Bermuda to Essex, my father died in Bermuda. And this is uh, an elegy I wrote for him in another of my workshops called Losing Heart, Finding Voice, Writing in Response to Despair. You can see we have a lot of fun in my workshops. <laughs> my father, dead these 50 years and more, has forgotten how much he loved me no longer sees the smudges on my cheek when his Time magazine slipped under the couch to lose itself in shifts of dust, has long let go of those cucumbers sliced so thin for his sandwich my thumb wouldn't stop bleeding, 
and can't even imagine that golden day he watched me shinny up the pawpaw tree, spicy scent of lantana spilling down the wall. Doesn't recall how perfectly I divided the pulpy yellow fruit into quarters, laid them in a sun circle around the blue plate to show him the glisten of those black seeds a Bermudian once told me guaranteed you would live a hundred years. It seems the dead have short memories, lose heart much sooner than we want to believe. So um, after my mother died, um, well, she died about 13 years ago, I guess, um, she, um, she had asked us to scatter her ashes in Bermuda, my sister and me. We were going to go down. And I almost made it, but I managed to lose my suitcase or rather my bag with everything in it at the airport. So we couldn't go, but my sister scattered her ashes just a little later than my mother had in mind. My mother rebukes me from the turquoise depths of the Bermuda Sea, chides me again for the nine long years she spent underneath my coffee table. Gray mass, once bone, once flesh, crammed in plastic, tucked in the polished wood box she chose. Tartly reminds me my promise included my stepfather's ashes, which she's heard lie in St. Louis instead. Of course, my mother, being dead, no longer has power nor voice. She simply drifts through shimmers of pale light, her dust catching in ragged coral, a scuttle of crabs mingling her with sand, and a scatter of blue and gold angelfish darting in and out of the haze of her settling. So this next poem is one that I wrote in the workshop this summer if you get there before I do. And actually, it was a wonderful workshop. I worked with 10 extraordinary poets. And we wrote together um, for three hours um, once a week for six weeks. And we laughed a lot. We were writing about death. <laughs> this is a double sonnet. The Cradle Maker, an elegy of sorts. I am standing in the kitchen, rocking damp bread dough back and forth. You are waiting, safe in my belly, still two months away from the tearing free. Your father is climbing the hill behind the cobwebbed kitchen window, searching for a perfect cedar, so he can rasp his handsaw back and forth, his breath spiraling like wood smoke in the January air so he can haul the small cedar downhill, leaving a feathery path in the snow, lift the tree onto the screen porch, where he will spend a week cutting slats, nailing them together, measuring, remeasuring, finally carving two rockers, adding the jut of a cedar pole, so I can push the cradle, rock you back and forth. This is a poem for the man who held you close to his chest, who gazed down at your crinkled face the day they set you free from the hospital nursery, the day after you had caught your breath, your temples bruised purple by forceps, who whispered to you over and over how he loved you beyond words. This man who had never built a cradle before, not for one of those three children he left behind in his first marriage. The man who would leave us behind just shy of your first birthday, but built you a cradle with perfect love before you were born, so that when you startled out of sleep, eyes flying open, fingers spread wide, I could lean over from our bed to rock you, rock you, rock you. Um, I am currently in the middle of writing 
a heroic crown of sonnets. As Marilyn Nelson said, she wrote this extraordinary heroic crown of sonnets about Emmett Till. She said, good luck, Edwina. I said, key? Uh, a heroic crown of sonnets, for those of you who don't know, it's 15 sonnets. And after the first sonnet, the first line of each succeeding sonnet takes its first line from the last line of the sonnet before it. And then the 15th sonnet is all the first lines of the preceding 14. Yeah. It's so much fun. <laughs> I, it's so much fun. Now, mind you, I've only written six so far, but I got the idea for this because about a year and a half ago, when the trees were dying from drought and they were cutting them down all around in Mudis, I heard this voice inside my head and it said, it, it, it sounded like someone telling a story many years from now and the voice said, there used to be these beautiful things called trees. So I wrote a sonnet called Bedtime Story about trees and um, so uh, that was the first one, and then I wrote, I've written, as I said, six. So I'm, go I'm going to read five and six for you, um, because the sixth one is one that I wrote um, recently, this summer, and uh, it's in response to an experience I had in Bermuda when I was there in May. So there's five, and then there's six. And the, the sonnet sequence is called, When We Could Still Breathe Outside, Bedroom st Bedtime Stories. Five. After the butterflies dissolved to air, air mustard yellow, more like smoke each day, we went on spilling what we didn't need into every body of water, streams to oceans, until every fish vanished. No, not all at once, but forever. Still, I recall one morning before we killed the fish, a June morning when we could still bear the white ball of the sun sifting through haze, and I was sitting on a little wooden dock, dangling my feet in cool water, felt soft mouths nibbling my toes, saw light and shadow shifting, darting with trout, and I threw my head back and laughed out loud. Six. When I threw back my head and laughed out loud, I was home again, that volcanic rim we called Bermuda, walking through shallow water, pushing it aside with my thighs while I looked down at a sea turtle. Oh, how to describe a sea turtle's diamond ridge shell, a circle the size of my arms, reaching out in front of my heart, fingertips touching. This turtle sweeping rippled sand with its front flippers, searching for food, then lifting its pale beaked head above sun-spangled water. Ah, breathing in, dropping its head under water, moving on, shush, shush. This happened, yes, I called it heaven. My last poem is for my beloved husband, Greg. Um, he's known as the good husband. <laughs> and this is from a chapbook I wrote um, during a two-week time at a wonderful place called um, Still Point, where I get to sit in a cabin in the woods and not talk to anybody, but just read and write poetry. Solace. I hunker to gather shattered blue glass from a hummingbird feeder the raccoon tossed in the garden last night and retrieve my gnawed jade plant, eyeing the Japanese maple's lace where the cat crouches two feet from a rabbit. The noon sun throws tatters of light through cloud scrim, scattering shadows downhill. I clap the rabbit free of its days and go inside to set the ravished jade on the windowsill. Then wash and refill what's left of the feeder, hang it in falls of purple petunias, call you to sit in the swing by the trees to pass solace and the puzzle back and forth between us. Thank you.
Thank you, Edwina. That was lovely. I'm pleased to announce that we have Edwina Trentham's books on sale tonight, both Stumbling into the Light and the limited edition of Dinner Parties. As always, the proceeds go to the author. By the way, this is a beautiful book, which is just lovely to hold in hand if you like a collector's item in your midst. This gives me a chance to thank our friends from Bank Square Books for their support. It's mystic lucky to have so hip and friendly an independent bookstore. Also, yes. <clears throat> I also want to thank the Mystic Museum of Art for welcoming the Arts Cafe again. Our community is lucky to have so, such a resource, and we are grateful to feel at home here. So on with our show. Ha. <clears throat> for our musical interlude this evening, I'd like to ask your help in introducing the marvelous singer-songwriter duo the sea, the sea. I'll let you know when you can help. If you can bear with me a minute, I'll try to instruct you in your bit. So please repeat after me. The sea, the sea. The sea, the sea. Not bad, not bad. Now imagine that it's something tremendous, that it fills your heart. The sea, the sea. OK, you're ready. <laughs> Hold on to that until I cue you. In the meantime, for those of you who have not had the pleasure of hearing the sea, the sea, you should know that Chuck E. Costas and Myra Stanley are the remarkable talents that make up this folk pop duo band. Though Chuck was once upon a time the state troubadour of our fair state, he and Myra now live in, or are headquartered in upstate New York. Huffington Post has described the sea, the sea as two of the loveliest male female voices you might ever hear. And the influential, influential music journal, No Depression, has praised them for their well-crafted songs. They've toured the country seemingly continuously behind two previously highly regarded albums playing ever more important venues. But a short while ago, they released their third album called From the Light, which has changed everything. Its new songs are stunning for their melodic beauty and impassioned lyrics. And its shimmering production values make it an album that rewards repeated listens. But it's especially good to hear this music live. So here comes your cue. <laughs> Ready? Because you studied your Greek, as it seems Chuck and Myra also did, and because in particular you steeped yourselves in the, wor in the works of Xenophon, and most particularly his masterpiece, Anabasis. You will remember that touching moment in the story when the Greek soldiers, in returning to their coastal homeland after an arduous inland war, cry out in joy, the sea, the sea. So I 
I've been going in circles, no way. Times are lonely when times your only friend doesn't stay. For so long I stood there in its way. Cause I will keep on running Are we always running? Even if it all falls apart I will keep on running Are we always running? As Christy mentioned, we just released this new album. Um, man, I can't believe it's uh, three months ago now. It feels like so. We we left for tour the day the day we released it on June first, and uh, have been on the road playing almost every night since then uh, until about a week ago. So we're we're a little out of it. Um, but in the best in the in, best, in the best way. yeah in the best way. Um, uh, that first song we played was not on the album, but I think the rest of the songs we're going to play tonight are. Yes. Um, this one um, came from a conversation that I had with my mom a couple of years ago now. Uh, she's from Norway, and um, my grandparents, I spent a lot of time with them growing up. Um, spent a bit of time not understanding what they were saying. Um, and Because they were speaking Norwegian. Yes, I assume. <laughs> That's obvious, um, but it may not be. And uh, my mom, we were having this conversation, she told me that he used to have this phrase that he used all the time, and it was just the most beautiful thing I'd heard. Um, and I decided I was gonna steal that from him, uh, or share it with him, and put it into a song. And so um, that's where this next one came from. It's called Good For Something. They did what they had to 
I said what they had to say Each went a separate way They listened when the wind blew How things change without you knowing How things change without showing the only choice you thought you had was all or nothing Things can never be so bad that they're not good for something next song um, we thought we were being super clever and made a, wrote an entire song based around the personification of truth uh, and then realized we just accidentally wrote a murder ballad <laughs> it's called bang 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 <laughs> Show me, but 
Gemini. It's inspired uh, by the way we can sort of get in our own ways sometimes.
the reasons why you've done things this way before do i put my hands in the sky till you realize all that's worth fighting so much. The song is called Ricochet.
It is my great pleasure to introduce tonight's featured poet, Margaret Gibson. Astonishingly, Ms. Gibson lives among us, just down the road in Preston, of all places, which proves that even great poets must be from somewhere. In the course of her, ooh, in the course of her long and distinguished career, Margaret Gibson has been acknowledged one of our most, one of our foremost poets. Indeed, the great Jane Hirschfeld has described Ms. Gibson as a master poet. Each of her 11 previous books has been an event in the poetry world as she kept her way steadfastly with a poetic mission that connects her work to the biblical psalms and the epics and myths of antiquity. A mission to voice poetry in prayer, praise, and celebration of the mystery and majesty of life. Ms. Gibson has brought to her mission the great gifts of a clear musical voice, a raconteur's talent for telling the story well, and a seemingly inchoate empathy that has enabled her to convincingly connect the human day to day with the cycles of nature. Not surprisingly, Ms. Gibson's books have garnered many honors, among them the Lamont Poetry Prize, the Melville Kane Award, and two Pushcart Prizes. One of her masterworks, The Vigil, A Poem in Four Voices, was a finalist for the National Book Awards. And five of her books have been nominated for the Pulitzer Prize. Tonight, Ms. Gibson will debut her just published new book of poems called Not Hearing the Thrush, a book of courage and wisdom which the Pulitzer Prize winning poet Stephen Dunn describes as, and I quote, a great book by one of our best poets. The poems of not hearing the wood thrush trace the arc of a crisis in the poet's life. Their subtext is the prospect of old age spent without a beloved husband who is, dying, who is in the dying throes of Alzheimer's. Several poems talk of facing not knowing, of uncertainty. They tell of fear, fear of loneliness, and of course, fear of death. These are beautiful poems whose insights take your breath away. They form a love story, a love of the beloved, but also a love for life. They also contend with hope, dear old hope who invites us to persist and to imagine meaning. But this poet has the guts to acknowledge that hope may be an illusion, a kind of biological instinct, which may have no basis in reality. Not Hearing the Wood Thrush is an important and useful book because in grappling openly and honestly with the great questions of life and death, they suggest by example that in posing these questions, we all are ennobled and gain strength to go on. My friends, the Arts Cafe is deeply proud to present to you Margaret Gibson. I want to congratulate the Arts Cafe, 25 years and going strong. Um, I want to say that the Melville Kane Award was, co I was a co-winner with Stephen Dobbins, who is here tonight. I always want to correct that. <laughs> and also that this is one of the hardest and easiest and most beloved audiences to read to. Hardest because I know a lot of you, and a lot of you know me. <laughs> so I can't fool you uh, or tell you too many fictional stories. Um, but I'm delighted to be here, um, really delighted. And um, 
So here we go. Um, um, I I don't write clappers. So, um, and you may not feel inclined to clap anyway, but if you feel that itch, just try to repress it. <laughs> um, and the reason for that is that um, uh, these are quiet poems, they're meditative poems, and they're poems that are coming from my deep and hope place and hopefully reaching t that same place in you. Um, and I want you to follow that. If you if you feel so inclined, and not be distracted by feelings, if you have to applaud or anything. Okay. A whisper. Draw close. Everyone you love and everyone you don't will someday die. You know this. Resist or embrace it, either way, sadness as pungent as jasmine sooner or later fills you. Let it settle. Let all your holy strivings settle. There's a covert in your body where either yes or no is the answer, and it doesn't matter which you say. Be there long enough, every morning sun streams through the original window. I'm going to read a poem now called Not Knowing. Um, I think not knowing is not something to be faced. I think it's something to be embraced. Um, it, I think lots of times we get in trouble by fooling ourselves that we know what's going on when we're in this amazing mystery. And to have the mind and the heart open to not knowing is, um, is a great asset. Um, it gets you a little nervous sometimes, I'll admit, but it's, it's to be cultivated. Um, this is a poem about a, um, a cousin, um, a family cousin who, uh, uh, who died. The poem is called Not Knowing. Late day, sun behind mountains going blue and slate, he climbed the steep field back of the house, perhaps to see wider sky, then stumbled as the thud of pain buckled him and took him down, face down, in the field his parents' ashes had sweetened. No one knew where he was for hours. And so starlight enters the poem, possibly frost, and the snort of a startled deer happening upon him as the men would toward morning, looking for him as we look now for a reason. Had he completed his work here? By any measure, his leaving us seems too soon. Was he complete? He'd completed the restoration of his house and fields, told his distant son he loved him, gathered family together, cooked the feast and carved, passed along the gold watch that had come to him over generations. Perhaps he was ready, perhaps not. I think something in us knows what we do not, and I hold that not knowing close. It sharpens the moment, it opens the heart. Years from now, or months, too soon, I may remember him as one would look out a window closed against the wind and hear the sharp call of wild geese muffled by glass and indoor chatter. Right now I still hear his voice. I still smell the cold air on his coat when he came back into the house full of family and laughter, carrying an armful of wood for the fire. Um, books of poems are come out. They're always trying to catch up with your life. Um, you know, <laughs> these poems were written, or I began writing these poems um, shortly after uh, my husband entered residential care um, in Westerly, and um, instead of a life of shared companionship and mutual solitude, we, we were both writers and spent a lot of time mulling things over and staring out windows and et cetera. 
Um, I, I was in a kind of bare aloneness that um, required um, some doing. Um, your imagination is not always the best under those circumstances, especially in the winter when you're cut off. There's a foot of snow outside and you can't sleep and you don't know whether the furnace is going to come on or not. And this is a poem called Night Thoughts. It's one of, uh, I'm going to read you another poem after this too about working with fear and imagination and your mind gone nuts. <laughs> um, there are some stories, um, some teaching stories uh, in the poem, so listen up. Night Thoughts. They're on the move again, across the soundless moonlit snow, five deer, single file along the narrow trail, they deepen night after night with their heart-shaped hooves. Shivering, I watch them. Back in bed, in flannel up to my nose, I listen and listen. In my mind, already the pipes have frozen and burst. Water in a cascade that resembles plumes of ice down rock face along the interstate. In my mind, this house is a hovel of ice. Outside, wolves howl. Opposing armies clash and scatter. A blue hand sticks out of the snow. <laughs> Almost I reach to take it. I'm here alone. No, I'm not alone. I'm one of the women left to wander crazed in snow. The men conscripted, the villages burned. And then here it is, like a revision of history, the click of the furnace. Oh, blessed click. <laughs> of course, by now, I'm too awake to sleep, and because there's something else I don't want to remember, and perhaps to spice my fear, the residue of my fear, I tell myself the story of the monk who's fallen just over the lip of a cliff. There he is, holding on to a root that's slowly coming loose, and if that's not enough, a tiger crouches over him on the precipice, just then as if an invisible furnace clicks on. He discovers within his reach on the cliff face the single bounty of an, of an inauspicious planting, a beautiful berry, fully ripe. Serenely, the monk picks the berry and eats. Delicious. And as he falls, I rem <laughs> and as he falls, I remember what's at work in this poem and all the rest I write. Each poem, I rescue my fear with a berry. One could say it works. The fear vanishes, so does the berry, and momentarily, so do I. To vanish is to live at the heart of the matter. To vanish is to live at the lip of invitation, embraced by emptiness and great joy. Just so, one night after Zazenkai, Freezing cold on the beach, last birds wheeling over the snow at the edge of the ocean, at the edge of the world. Clear how we felt, we reached out for each other. No hope of remedy or rescue, no time for fear. There was only the moment and the embracing, just that. When we walked back over the dunes, I could see as if from a great height, as if from the other side of death, Two figures ink brushed on groundless black and white. Two figures along a curve of road as if in a painting by Charles Chu, who, whenever he was done, bless him, lifted his brush, stepped back from his work, and let out a tremendous ha! Um, I, I forgot to tell you that Zazen Kai is an all-day sit at a Zendo, and I've, many of you will remember Charles Chu, who was uh, for years a professor of painter and professor of calligraphy at um, Connecticut College. Okay, one more sort of on this, in this vein. Um, you may recall that uh, Emily Dickinson, uh, personified death, because I could not stop for death, he kindly stopped for me. Personified death as a suitor, and you know, took her off in his carriage. 
So I thought, well, okay, let's try it. Uh, I'm going to personify fear. So here we go. The poem is called Soap. What can I say? It begins in the dining room and ends up in the shower? I don't know. Here we go. Soap. I can't breathe. If I were honest, I'd admit to the under-my-skin damp called loneliness, called fear. If courageous, I'd swallow hard and say to fear, come sit right down, be fear at the head of the table and serve fine wine, cheese, and bread. Tomatoes so dead ripe, their warm, earthy scent fills the air the way honeysuckle suckles the night. I'd confess to the itch of expectation, the itch of attachment. I'd display the bruises on my arms, proof of my struggles, as if fear in his crisp white shirt and black tevas could be impressed by fearlessness, perseverance, compassion, or skill. Fear knows all about evasion. So I confess it. I say aloud, I'm afraid. Without further word, looking fear straight in the eye, I began to take off my clothes. I know, I know, it surprises me too. <laughs> But a stir of wind blows through the open windows and I hear the tree frogs loudly tweeting their coded messages for sex. I begin to breathe. Fear, purely sensed, takes a mere 90 seconds to crest and fall away. This is a fact. Lingering only when one feeds it the custard of stories and lies. Oh, how fear then flexes his muscles. But say we lean into each other, dear fear. Let's be groundless, curious lovers. Let's be Quakers and clouds. Let's stay present to the steamy pour of the shower, to the curve of soap on skin. Let's melt into this feeling, fear in my knees, in my spine, fear between my breasts, fear nesting in my armpits, fear slippery on the soles of my feet. Dear fear, let's give a good soaping to your c**k and to my will you get the idea. We're soaping a doorway through uncertainty to freedom. As we soap behind us, vast space and light open up. There, there, my darling. Let me take care of you. More sandalwood scent, a good hard rub to the scalp. Relax. We'll rinse and watch the suds bubble down the drain. You can trust me. You can trust me. Just let go. <laughs> so. Okay. I'm changing the tone a little bit. I'm going to read the title poem, Not Hearing the Wood Thrush. Uh, I live in the woods in Preston and am um, enriched, my life is enriched by a, light, a lot of deep woods birds, among them the wood thrush, which, as you know, has a wonderful silvery flute like song. Uh, one summer, I did not hear it. All summer. Not hearing the wood thrush. There are thoughts that come to the door screen summer nights, lured by a light kept on by some childhood fear. They bump up against it or cling. Darkness frees them. There is love comes late in darkness and gives no reason, body speckled, sweet as a pear. How nakedly the heart bears its weight. At dusk, deep in the summer woods, a silence, something that was here, expected to continue being here, isn't. I see the line in my palm etched by fate and not yet snipped. The afterlife, what is it if not a further body desire turns toward? No clear edge to the universe now, the scientists tell us. They describe an intense fuzziness instead. Worlds spins it, world spins into other worlds as incandescent as what arises from cocoons ripening on the underskin of leaves and stars.
Um, this book has been described as a companion to uh, Broken Cup. Um, but as you're hearing, I mean, um, David and his Alzheimer's and my journey with him in the beginning and middle years of that disease were, um, David was right front and center. Um, this, these are m much more inward poems about my dealing with um, uh, the thing, the loneliness, fear, the fear of death, facing things day by day. Um, I wasn't going to read this, but I'm going to. Um, it's called Waking Early, the Day Unborn, just because it takes us back a little bit more into the material circumstances that, spa that started the poems, started this book of poems. That dim shape at the edge is a coyote come to check the remains of the winter-killed deer. Now it slips into the shadows part of what is hidden from us, the larger part of who we are. We have our instincts, our scripts and habits, perhaps a few clear moments whose trail may have led to this moon rinse to dawn or not. Last night, for the first time, I slept on your side of the bed. I haven't washed the pillowcase, wanting to keep the scent of you here. Inevitable, incurable, slow, your illness takes you like snow melt, as you who love to track insight to its lair, word to its hidden root, forget most everything once you knew. A child, I'm told, may be born without sufficient folds in the brain for a verbal intelligence to arise. Untimely ripped, come unprepared or wise, we are here, it seems, to bear the mystery. Given portions of light and dark, given protein, spirit, hunger, patience, time. So how many people in this room talk to themselves? <laughs> <laughs> so um, living alone, these are not funny poems as it develops, but living alone, you know, and not having David to talk to, I was talking a lot. And um, the more I talked and the deeper the conversations got, I realized that I was um, entering a kind of um, uh, condition and tradition that resembled prayer. Um, and um, I've kept God out of my poems for years. I mean, the word God is a suitcase word that's packed with all sorts of stuff by all kinds of people. And when I say God, I don't know what in the world you're going to hear or what it means. So instead of addressing these poems, um, which, as I say, are in, a, in the prayer tradition of prayer, to God, I address them to no one. Um, with the understanding that no one might mean the God behind God. It might mean what Zen meditators think of as emptiness when you understand emptiness as the fullness of um, an undivided reality that's radiant and simple and ultimately beyond words. Um, so I'm going to read you a few poems from this um, sequence um, of poems addressed to, um, to no one. Um, one, the first poem ends, um, I have no one now, the no one's you. Um, and the second one, um, with the title, Not to Remain Altogether Silent, which is what St. Augustine said when he wrote a book and then went on to write something of about 2,000 pages. Fortunately for you, this is a lot shorter. Um, and at thinking the way poets do, it's, um, it's an attempt to make that mysterious one, no one, we may or may not address, uh, reaching into the deeper parts of ourselves. Um, it's an attempt to embody that through imagery, through the things of this world, not to remain altogether silent. All the time I kept you out of my poems, you found a way into my body instead. Instead of your becoming another word for dove or wrist bone, owl or stone, you've become the impulse that has me raise cairns to mark my way. You're what all verbs traverse, 
a fuse for the urge to look at what I can't see within what I can. Also, the stillness inside me as wind-riven leaves are driven over the roof shingles into the night. Kindled by earth and sky, you're the touch of a tongue on my skin, contingent and mortal, and the shy, reluctant love of faithfulness to what I feel when at not times I think there are no gods. You are in me what is crucial and crucible when the soul and its root fire lasers and wells each fissure and craze line of my loving, elusive, if pervasive, you. How stark it is to be alive. And although absence is the form you take in what we call the world, how durable. Um, Brother Lawrence uh, wrote a book called Practicing, or his letters and, and um, writings were collected in something called Practicing the Presence of God. So Brother Lawrence appears in this poem. Um, it's wonderful, but not to be able to sleep. <laughs> Isn't it? <laughs> You're up late. Um, the night is quiet. Um, all sorts of things occur to you. This poem is called Ripe. And again, I'm speaking to no one. In the local moment, hear the rasp of the dog's tongue on his fur and on his cushion while music ferrets its way through the interstices of the trees between this house and Amos Lake, where the party is almost over. Midnight. Thinking spoils everything, don't you think? Tonight, I choose to be guided by, you give it a name, no one, I can't. That's why I'm talking to you, practicing your presence, as did Brother Lawrence. Doubtless, he'd wiggle his toes, listen to the mosquito whine, mistake the engine noise of the cargo jet for distant thunder, then tell you about it. No prayers by rote. I'd be so drawn so close to the source, there's no distance between self and other. Isn't this how to live? And this is not an easy thought. The upsurge of violence in Missouri, Palestine, India, Ukraine boards any piety like a pirate, making off with my peace of mind. Now I'm a refugee, now an owl, now a cooling current of air from the open window. By the moon's light, I can see the residue of milk and cinnamon smudged along the glass of the cup I drank down to help me sleep. Now I'm a cup. Empty, but for a mission I have no name for. I long to let go. I long for you to take me over. I long to sink my teeth into you. No longer a ripe idea, but a peach about to turn if I don't eat it and right now. <laughs> Two trees. Remember, I'm talking to no one, right? Okay. I want to know you the way I know summer's ending. The light low enough late afternoons to shadow the clabbards, an undercoat of burnt sienna singeing the leaves of a maple, tobacco juice on the hand that traps and tries to hold any grasshopper. Over here, two trees blighted nearly to their summits. The die-off started a kind of seasonal dementia. Sometimes the beautiful are all so good, an old woman said to me after I'd done a small kindness anyone could do. My beloved's hands are bruised where the aides have to hold him. It's harder for him, incontinent, to feel any gratitude for help. None of us really wants to need help. As late light brightens the bones of the birch whose limbs shine like the raised arms of Krishna's beloved dancing in the glade, I become aware, no one, how relieved I am you don't step right up and clarify the mystery. With you, it's all sparks of light, tense and hence, perhaps an occasional bolt out of the blue to shake loose a sense of terror 
that may evolve somehow into clarity, emergent even in decline and ruin. I look about and find whatever I see unfinished. Forget heaven, refuse it, in fact. I love what's raw and wretched and redolent and raw about you, in me, through me, as me. And yet, as we both know, the love I express is too easy. Something in me must die. Motive for praise, perhaps. I have friends who, talking about death, claim it's not death but dying they fear. The process, the pain, the lack of privacy, the pain. They're too savvy to turn to you, no one, as a personal comforter. It's not about me, one says. Another speaks of the injustice of self-pity. As for me, I think with practice, fear becomes a koan that ramifies, then rings the mind into a, the standstill clarity of non-thinking, where you live, no one. Things fall apart. The memoir cannot hold my husband on the cusp of memory loss scrawled in the margin. Story our center, he believed. Tell me about pain, how subtle it is, how sly, and tell I do. I tell and tell until the telling numbs like denial or suddenly surges, rousing its own version of an afterlife. No one, your story if you have one, is the birth of stars. So terrifying and vast, the mind implodes, collapsing every metaphor I've heard or read or said. Your story, it's selfless. If love, it's love that continues without us. And so quiet. OK, Christy said we were going for midnight tonight. <laughs> What he actually said was, read as long as you like. It's about the same thing. No, I'm, um, I'm going to read um, two more from the No One sequence, and then I may, with your indulgence, read um, a couple of new poems, OK? Um, so still in this sequence um, with No One, uh, the setting has changed. Um, it's by the river. I had a friend who lent me an apartment for a little, you know, R&R &R time, and I would sit and watch the river. It was wonderful. And um, I was looking out the window one day, and I heard a voice. And the voice said, Come to the river. Come to the window. It's your river, too. There's no one close beside me, no breath in my ear, only cold air and late sun aflame in the winter trees, all of it carried by the stillness of the bright water. As if they were husks of possessive pronouns, mind and body fall away, and I am the whole sky of birds pouring now as if through a funnel into oncoming night, such an inrush of wings and outcry that in a flash I understand incarnate. Everything shines. I absorb the shining and find it again, no one, in you, more intimate than any lover gives to his beloved the taste of her body, giving it back to her mouth by his tongue. God, I love my life. Each flash of radiance, each ghost of grief. Why wait for the sky to open in a waterfall of spirits ascending and descending? Let everything be as it is. Let everything be as it is. Um, and the last in the sequence of poems to no one is called Unconditional. Here's the secret. It's not in the poem. The secret is to learn to bless loss, because that releases love unconditionally. That's the secret. 
But each of you has to find it your own way and to, to express it your own way. So that's the challenge. That's your homework assignment. Okay. Unconditional. As the slow work of God continues breath by breath, the soul sinks into a depth of leisure that allows living as the river lives. Now I no longer persist in telling stories I know aren't true, however they might comfort or thrill. Oh, I have stories. But the protagonist, whether flawed or idealized, is a fiction dressed up in oak leaves, impulse, metaphor, and the sweet, sweet myths of metamorphosis. These days I'd rather sit by the river and listen. Tell me, no one, what will happen to the fields I love? the woods, the birds that vanish and return, animals, friends, family, where do they go? Lives that quick or slow move into a further intensity of vibration, then disappear. And I want to know what happens to the heart. Not, can this marriage be saved? Not, even, can it be understood? Remember the good old days of conditioned love. Remember, I'll do this if you'll do that. Back then, the marriage had papers beside the door, and it had to pee on them before it learned to ask to be let out into the endless, unconditional bounty of the wind, the trees, the stars. No longer. I love my beloved no matter what, no matter how or why. It's as if the river has deepened its channel and widened out. The feeling remains, Teresa of Avila mused, that God is on the journey too. How does it happen? Some days I only am that I am when known, <clears throat> when known by what I do not know. And that mystery, no one, you. Okay. I'm going to read two poems, new poems, one short and one longer. Are you all with me? Are you okay? <laughs> all right, okay. You're not going to stone me out of the room? All right, good. Listen, for a little break, there's something I want to do. There are a group of women here tonight with whom I have the great good fortune to read and critique poems. Uh, we call ourselves the Connecticut River Poets, and I want them to stand up. They're right over here. Edwina's one of them, Barbara Batt, Pat Barone. Where are you, Pat O'Brien, Lorreen Reese? Lynn Neely, wonderful poets, just embrace them. See, you thought you were in a room with just ordinary people, and by God, <laughs> all these poets in disguise. Okay. Okay. Um, David died on December 27th, which was their 42nd wedding anniversary. And I was with him, and also his um, son and daughter. We had been with him for three days. And after he died, we did something together um, that I, and I want to read, read you what it is. Um, it was our last, I don't know. It's called Washing the Body. And last, we washed his body. Last, we rolled it to one side of the bed, rocked it gently back, the long length of him settled now onto a clean sheet. Last, I followed a crease on his forehead with my finger. Last, his daughter washed his hair, massaging his scalp, sloshing the soapy water. Last, his son sponged his shoulders, and I each finger. He had beautiful hands. Last, his thighs, his knees, his shin blades. Last, we washed his feet, their soles a smooth new silk, and I, for the last time, his genitals, 
still warm as a wood's earth nestle of wild orcas. His no breath now stayed sweet. Last, his eyebrows bushy, outrageous, a fleck of water caught there, bright in the lamplight as if a snowflake from a walk we took years back across a white field had freshly fallen. I don't know who crossed his arms across his chest. And last, he was warm when I kissed a mouth that would not close nor speak nor allow us to enter the mystery of his being beyond us now, no crossing that threshold. And the silence in the room was, as it always is, ordinary and vast. Um, the concern for climate change, global warming, and what we've been doing to the earth um, is another form of meditating on lastness that has been in my poems before. Um, but I want to read a, a somewhat long poem that's a little bit in the vein of the one I just read you uh, called Irrevocable. Um, it's um, I think we have to go to what we love the most sometimes, the most particular thing we love the most, in order to expand our knowledge and love to things that are sometimes too large to grasp, the universe itself, the cosmos, all the rest of it. So this is a poem called Irrevocable. It is. Um, uh, a love song, in a way. Uh, it's a warning. Um, irrevocable. Someone no longer alive is hovering over a great expanse of smart weed, panic grass, and midden where a house used to be, where trees and gardens once flourished, where puddles and ponds held a sky of clouds and stars in place for a moment, and you lived there. Ah, oh, my dear. I speak from the liminal space where your beloved's last breath slipped into your body, then out the window into the winter chill, whose horizon line it rolled up as if it were twine, into a ball, then into a point, a still point, a full stop in the heart. From that point, I speak. As once you washed the body of your beloved, let us wash for the last time this one earth, this only and only once, for once and for all earth, as if it were a lover who has died, and we, not knowing what to do, at last must wash the poles, north and south, where long ago ice cracked open, sheared off, and melted. Last, the mountain peaks, Last, the crown of oaks and maples on whose bare branches long strips of torn plastic flutter. Also, the steeples, the turrets, the domes. Last, the open fields and meadows, wash them clean. The vast desert and its last oasis, riverbeds and shrunken rills, ravines and gullies, the rocky promontories from which we viewed the sea as it rose to cover the cities. Last, the cities, submerged full fathom, or in low tide, only the tips of the high rises winking up and the towers. Last, the sidewalks, shop windows, market stalls. Last, pebble, shell, and skull. Last, lark and satellite, wash them, and the field of broken mirrors. Last the house, last the bed, last the hills of midden and their treasures, a button, a seed, a feather, a zipper, a chip of china plate. Last the nose cone, the black box, last the trawler, the landing gear, the microchip, the missing part. Last the prayer rugs, the pews, the cushions. Last, the seed of enlightenment beneath what remains of the small trees spreading canopy. 
Last, the factories, the foundries, the mills, the maze of subway tunnels, the turnstiles. Last, the eye of the needle through which we could not pass. Last, a gun, a mine, a missile. Last, a bridge. Last, middle C on the piano. Last, a cello, a violin cello. In particular, the sonata for violin cello number two in D, opus 64 by Heinrich Verdhardsgazen. Hertz Zogenberg, precious because it was the last music you listened to. Precious because, like the last word of your beloved, you did not know it was last. Last, the pattern of fish displayed on ice and their many-eyed, one-eyed gaze. Last, the last whale beached on the shore at Truro. Last, the glint of an eye in the periwinkle, the lovely, sinuous ripple of a reclusive snake. Last, the chemicals, the vitamins, the pills, the chemicals. Last, a hearing aid, a pair of binoculars, a surgeon's knife, a sling, a robotic hand. Last, to list only a few from the multitude that perished, fox and laughing gull, swallowtail and hawk, lion, panther, vole, giraffe, mosquito, trillium, hummingbird, hibiscus, owl. Last, the very last line in a poem by Rilke, the line you can't forget the ache of, the line you didn't enact, not one syllable of it. You must change your life. Space, of course, lasts. I walk upon it as one would walk on a tablecloth for a table no one will set. What's left of my eyesight has dimmed. What I hear is only wind, and that muted. And because I have nothing to write on, I build cairn after cairn, lifting stones, balancing them, touching what remains in place as if it were a new alphabet or a sentence in Braille. You were reading the last of the Earth's last rivers and mountains. Do you know that? These stones, these silences, the last words held in mind for a moment, as if they were a net of fireflies shimmering in a summer field one can't tell apart from a night sky and stars. Wash them. Each stone, each firefly, wash them clean. This one, a love cry, that one, lament. And the last one, the wing of a warning you might still be able to hear just as once, long ago, you caught the smoke of the oracle rising from a rift zone at the center of the earth. Almost done. If these cairns, these last syllables survive, there may be no one left to read the poem they write. But if by chance there is, let the stones be read aloud so that a human voice might widen its reach, floating off among the stars like the ringing through of a great bronze bell, like the audible layers of birdsong daily moving gradually west as dawn brightens, or used to, and the great earth turns. Thank you, Margaret. Thanks also to the sea, the sea, and to Edwina Trentham. For those of you who would like to take a little Margaret home with you tonight, I commend to you her wonderful new book, Not Hearing the Wood Thrush. My final thanks are to you as always, our audience. Take care and good night.